to admit you exist with God before you were born? Was there a relationship between you and God before you were born? Now, a lot of people can fight and argue without any scriptural basis on this. And we're going to get into it tonight and uh, we're going to prove our point, argue our point, our point uh, from a uh, really, really um, uh, solid foundation. And I believe it is necessary for us as believers and as the Christian Orthodox doctrine to understand where we come from and where we're going. Uh, does that remove salvation? It never, it never does. Okay, uh, you'll see why we're going to maybe get into why salvation came in tonight. It doesn't mean because we come from God that everything is fine. That's universalism. No, no, no. We don't believe, but our spirits do come from God. We're going to get into the makeup, the structures of the wording and scripture. Uh, we're going to use scripture to really, it's going to be a good message. I want you to stay tuned. Did God know you before your before creation? Did you exist before you were born? Did God know you and did you know God? I did, a, I did a YouTube video and people did all this stuff on us and different YouTube videos and cut out. And how does this prophet say that, you know, he knew God before and well, we did. The scripture is very clear. We can either choose to believe in the, um, the uh, uh, undiluted word of God, uh, the unchallenged word, um, pure, um, unadulterated, uh, God-breathed, inspired word rightly dividing the word of truth being a faithful ministry approved a minister approved by god uh you know using the word i live by law sola scriptura uh, to a degree to not what i mean by to a degree to not uh, what i mean by that is some people use sola scriptura to really become legalistic but when it comes to to basing a doctrine it has to be sola scriptura or scripture or sola, whatever they, however they pronounce it. But basically, uh, if it's not in scripture, can't base a doctrine on it. And scripture has to interpret scripture. Scripture has to interpret scripture. Very, very important. We did Bible study with all our people, with all our church last year when the church was closed, and we showed how to study your Bible, what Bible translations to use, what Bible programs to use. It's amazing. At the moment, I use a Bible program, for example, called Logos. Um, there's many other, there's olive tree, there is Esau. Esau is amazing because it's free and you can get a lot of things. Just, um, I love Logos because I paid for it for many years, got a very big package and I can really literally almost do anything on it. It's brilliant. The way it is advanced even now, you can really study scripture well, but a lot of people can even study scripture wrong. So, you know, scripture has to interpret scripture. And when it gets to the New Testament, Old Testament, there are certain referential laws, uh, laws, to reference, um, the Old Testament is there to back up the New Testament. It is there to solidify and to reference. A lot of people want to preach the New Testament without referencing to the Old Testament. And those are very important principles, very important laws when it comes to studying Scripture. So, you know, and uh, 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 this is, and we can't preach the Old Testament without a New Testament attitude or a New Testament um, uh, 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 implication or a new testament dispensation so we can pre a lot of people try to preach the old testament the un the old covenant without a new testament dispensation dispensation of grace mindset and when we do that we really misinterpret scripture we take it out of context we become legalistic and we simply preach the letter the law that brings condemnation so um so let's get let's get into this meeting did you exist before you were born? Did you exist with God before you were born? Did you, uh, did you have a life with God before you were born? And, uh, you know, in order for us to look at this, I want us just to look at a few points. And then we're going to close off and I'll, in terms of a good uh, foundation, a good uh, conclusion. But I want us to go to Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 26. Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 26. We have to look at where we originated, where the human spirit originated from. What is the original intent that God had for us? What was the type of wording that was used? What happened to Adam? What happened to Christ? What does the Bible say about Adam? What does the Bible say about Christ? And uh, if we go to Genesis chapter number 1 verse 26, we'll see. Listen here. The Bible says, then God said, then God said, let us make man in our image. Now, I want us to 
Understand the word image, very important. And then it goes on, it says, according to our likeness. So you have image and you have likeness. There were people before Adam. There were people before Adam. They had the likeness of God, but not the image of God. Adam also lost the image. Christ restored the image. But there were people before Adam. They had the likeness of God, but not the image of God. We see this in the fall of uh, Adam and Eve after they fell. And we see this with, I believe it was Seth. And the Bible says that when Seth got children, they were in the likeness and image of God, not the image and likeness. No, Seth, yeah. It says in the likeness and image, not the image and likeness. And we see the whole thing turned around. So let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that the creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So we need to understand that the difference between image and likeness, spirit and body, the body is formed. The spirit is created. The body is formed. The spirit is created. The body is formed from the dust of the earth. The spirit man is created way before the body was formed. Uh, the word likeness means it, it alludes to a form and a shape function, walking, talking, that type of function. But the word image is a resemblance, a figure, a rip, almost a di direct representation, a direct copy. So what happens? Christ comes, restores us back to the image of the Son of God. Restores us back. So when Adam fell, what did Adam do? He lost the image. Not the likeness. He lost the image. Christ came and restored the image. Once the image is back restored, you have authority again. You're right aligned with Christ, with God, with Christ. The image of God is back on you. The identity, the original intent, destiny and purpose. When the devil looks at you, he sees the image of God. Why was there no devils manifesting in the Old Testament except for David? When David, uh, or devils cast out, except for David, David made, made Saul manifest and an evil spirit left him. But why were there no devils cast out? The image was not restored. When they saw the Son of God, they saw somebody whom has the image restored, the image of God. And devils began to realize they no longer have authority. That image was given back to us. So when the devil looks at you, when demons looks at you, what do they see? They see the image restored. The image of God. We are sons of God. We are not created sons of, oh, sorry, we are not begotten sons. We are created sons. Although we have been begotten through Christ. We are created. Christ is begotten. So Christ is the only begotten son. We are created sons. Some angels are sons of God. Some are not. Uh, uh, uh. So let's go to Genesis chapter number 2 verse 7. Genesis chapter number 2 verse 7. Listen to this. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And a man became a living soul. Man became a live, living soul. The word form is, means that the body of Adam was formed from the dust of the earth. It was a body that was laid lifeless. Then something happened. God came and breathed the breath of life into the body. 
So the breath of life, the body was a clone, if you can think of those movies. Like a surrogate body almost, like a clone body just lying there, dead. When Adam was created, the body was dead, was formed. Until God came and breathed the breath of life into him. The br word breath, neshama in the Hebrew, neshama. It means a wind. It includes divine inspiration. And it means soul and spirit in other, in other places in the Old Testament. So it means a wind, the breath of God. It's divine inspiration. Soul and spirit. But then, I want us to go further. It says the breath of life and man became a living being. The word life and living being there is what we call the word chai. Chai's. C-H-A-Y is shy, chais, which means living lives. It means the life force. And that is where we get the Eastern power from or spirit from, with which they call chai, chi, sorry, chi, chi. Mm -hmm. So what happens when those, uh, what do you call them? Senseis or, you know, uh, summarize and in, 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 where they, uh, what do you call them? Is it a sensei or a, but uh, those guys that practice for like 40 years and you can actually see them on YouTube and they would put their hand like this and power would hit people, even 20 people. It's like they, they move better in the, in, 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 in slaying, slaying people than, than, uh, than some ministers. <laughs> what is it? It's soul power. Soul power, it's chi. Yeah. They're still practicing their chi. But where the devil cannot create anything unless it comes from God, but it's perverted. So chi is actually biblical, but please, we are not endorsing chi. We are just saying the devil cannot create anything. He perverts it. She comes from the original breath of life. It's the soul. So when they operate in that, they operate in soul power. And that, op that opens up the doors for demonic power to come in, of course. But it doesn't remove the fact that it originated from God. Chais, the breath of life. And even when you look at the tree of life, the tree of life, the word life, chai. The breath of something is his character. Uh, let's just leave it at life force. It's the very soul you have, meaning that Adam was lifeless. He was dead, lifeless. And then a spirit came into him. Then life came to him. Then life came to him. So we see that the breath of God, in fact, that word breath, neshama, speaks of an eternal breath. Eternal. Let's go to Leviticus 17 verse 11. Leviticus 17 verse 11. Listen to this. Leviticus 17 verse 11. It says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I've given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar of atonement. God has given it to us. And we're going to look now how this life was given by God. And that's all good. But we were alive before. Now people are like, but why can't we remember? And this and that. Because we are interdimensional beings. There's no difference between you and an angel. Except the fact that... An angel doesn't have the redemptive power of the blood. Why did God not destroy Satan? Why did God not destroy Lucifer when what happened happened? Yeah. God cannot destroy a spirit. He can only separate a spirit. There are different laws. And please, when I say God cannot destroy a spirit, 
I am not speaking of uh, or I'm not removing his divine attributes and qualities of omnipotency, omniscience and omnipresence. He's a divine quality of omnipotency because he created the lake of fire. But guess what? They're not destroyed. They're still alive, just burning forever. So God had to remove, meaning, meaning he had to separate. When a spiritual being was created, a spiritual being doesn't operate via the words of destruction and death or destroying. The way we think in this dimension. God had to bring in and create a separation to come in. These are spiritual laws. So we are interdimensional beings. That's why you cannot have a memory of what happened. What is revelation about your call? It's simply discovering or remembering the conversation you had with God. And what I'm preaching, the, when I'm saying this, like you're remembering a conversation, it's not a doctrine. I'm speaking to you revelation, but I can base a lot of scriptures on it. Uh, do I put doctrine as an, uh, do I believe in predestination as doctrine? Yes. Not predestination, not pre-election as in salvation, but predestination as in destiny. Purpose, calling, the will of God, our life being mapped out in front of us. So, meaning that the life of the flesh is in the blood. It's not the blood. It's in the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. So there's a life force in blood that keeps the physical body alive. Uh, blood. But, it, but there's a spirit. So you'll see the soul of a person going to heaven and the soul of an animal going down into the earth. There's no such thing as a, as a dog heaven. There's no animals in heaven coming from the earth. Let me be emphatically clear on that. Am I saying there's no animals in heaven? Never. There is animals, creatures, there's spiritual beings there. And on the new earth, there'll be a new earth, like a natural creation here. But... It's, uh, there are no animals that will go from here to heaven. The Bible is very clear that the spirit, give me that scripture in Ecclesiastics, the soul of the animal will go down into the earth. Down. Ecclesiastics 3 verse 21. We'll check now. Yeah, the spirit of a man goes up and the spirit of the animal goes down. So what does it say? It says, who knows the spirit of the sons of men? Who knows the spirit of the sons of men? Which goes upward. Which goes upward. And the spirit of the animal. And the spirit of the animal. Which goes downward. Which goes downward. Very yes. simple. <laughs> very, very simple. Uh, 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 uh. Do animals have soul? Because then they must know they don't have a soul. Okay. They have a spirit. But it's the spirit of an inferior kingdom. You have an animal, you have a man, king, human kingdom. You have the kingdom of God. You have different, I understand, different dimensions and different creations. You have the angelic kingdom. You have the man, human kingdom. You've got uh, the animal kingdom, plant kingdom. What is the below? There's a fish kingdom also somewhere there. But then you have a biological. <laughs> or a what do you call it like a um yeah like a virus type kingdom and it can go very so you have different dimensions so um you know when it touch on the spirit of an animal and so now we can get very theological on it but they don't have no soul uh okay they don't have the chai the breath of god and bacteria and what made us d different from animals is the fact that we have the breath of God. We come from Him. You are a part from Him, a part of Him. Uh, Genesis, let's go to Genesis 2 verse 9. Genesis 2 verse 9. I'm going to carry on reading and I know many of you can just listen if you don't have your Bible with you. But Genesis chapter number 2 verse 9. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow. That is pleasant to the sight of good for uh, sight and good for food. 
the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The tree of life there, the word life, chai, chi. And I'm not endorsing chi, I'm just saying where it is originating from. It's been perverted. Uh, as angels don't have souls either because they don't repent. I don't believe. So wait, 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 wait. No, 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 no. They have a soul, guys. Ple you, you must understand what is the soul and the makeup of the soul. First of all, what's the makeup of the soul? Will, intellect, and emotions. So your spirit has three parts. Maybe you can help me. It's communion, fellowship, and intuition. So your spirit man is made up of three parts. Intuition fellowship and communion three parts your soul is made up of three parts emotions intellect and will then your body is made up of different gates okay but let's touch on the soul will intellect and emotions did angels have a will yes they still have a will do you know angels can still fall let's leave that one for the apologetics and so on <laughs> Uh, uh, angels have a will. So we establish they have a will. Do angels have emotions? Yes. We can see it all scripture, over scripture they have emotions. Do angels have an intellect? Yes. So that means they have a soul. And I hope this, this brings clarity. A lot of times we can watch movies so we can live, you know, we can, and, and, and we just kind of like take what people say on those type of things or your uh, new age type things and it doesn't line up with scripture. So the makeup of the tripod, tri to man. Okay, spirit, soul, body. The spirit has three parts, the soul has three parts, the body has many gates. Okay, so um, uh, uh, pigs and human DNA and yeah the, so that is uh, that is um, is that transhumanism or not yeah. I'm not exactly sure but yeah we have discussed that and we will we'll actually do a message on um, what do they call that word uh, or um, cloning. cloning like the, the, uh, the AJ guy the Jones guy um, uh, he called it um, uh, it starts with an E E uh, when they mix Anademics or eugenics or no 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 is it eugenics? So how come if angels have soul, why don't they die die like people? Yeah, that's eugenics. They don't. Guys, people don't die because they have a soul. People die because they have a body. Listen, let me help you here, and this is good because. It's relative to the subject. People don't die because they have a soul. People die because they have a body. Am I right? Yes. You live forever. You have a soul so that you can live forever. Yeah. Your soul will be cast into hell. And you'll still live there. I hope this makes sense. I hope this helps you guys and makes sense. Because when it comes to spirit, soul, body, a lot of us are influenced with new age. A lot of us are influenced with angel, uh, with uh, with angelic uh, doctrine. What I mean by that is like your new age type angel things with worship and and uh, people just you know they w use wording like soul and they mix it with spirit and people don't really understand that. So it's it's good to clarify that and um, I hope that you understand. I don't mean that in any way bad. I'm just answering to to help. And you cannot speak confusingly on this. You'll see. What do I use? I use scripture. I, you know, when it comes to spirit, soul, body, I know that that one very well. So why do people, why do the body die and we do, what? Why do the people's body die and how do we know our soul will stay alive? We know our soul will stay alive by, by believing in the, in the word of God, number one. Um, we, that's, that's actually it, you know. Um, Lovina, so, so. Why do the people's body, the body die because it's a natural body. Your dog dies. It's natural laws. Your body has to die. The, Paul says in the book of Corinthians, this body has to go back to the dust. It has to go back to the dust. And then we'll be given a glorified body, a spiritual body. But we have a spirit man inside of us. And if you look between those who died before the rapture and so on, they actually won't yet get a glorified body. You know, so there's like an in-between. And that's their spirit that is still alive there. So, no, 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 your body will die. And those, 
I understand there were people who preaching doctrines about immortality and stuff like that. Those are false doctrines. It will make you so confused. Oh my God, that even you will question common sense itself. Um, you know, please do not believe in immortality. Uh, and a sense that your physical body will not die. The only time your physical body will not die is if you live in the time of the rapture and you experience the rapture at that moment. That's the only time. And we see that with uh, both Elijah and Enoch as a part, a, a, as, a, as a type and shadow of the rapture of the church. It's very good to believe in the rapture. It is. We must believe in that. But we need to understand that, that there is no such thing as immortality without the rapture. This body, by law, has to go die. Even in the rapture, if this body will be changed into a glorious body. So you won't have this body in heaven. It will be changed into a glorious body. Okay? So, but you can believe that. Just do not believe in immortality. Where people say, I, I will never die as a Christian. I'm going to, you know, I know as a Christian I shouldn't smoke. I torture myself about this daily. Is it true that God won't use me or bless me in life until like what? Janine, good, like what, good question, Janine. Um, uh, no, I think, you, yes and no. I, 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 you know, look, in our flesh we make certain sins greater because it's more visible. We feel it's just on our human nature like that. Um it's in our human nature like that, you know, it's, uh, smoking will just harm you and your body. It's not going to do anything to God that I can tell you. Um, what does it do? It affects you, it affects your body, and it affects your testimony. So, we are encouraged that we are not ruled and mastered by sin. Uh, I do not have a sin nature. The moment I'm saved, I get the nature of Christ. Sin nature is broken. It doesn't mean I don't sin. No, 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 I sin. But we are no longer ruled, governed, mastered by that sin. The sin nature is broken. So it's a, uh, once you understand, Janine, once you're under really good teaching, good preaching, and we preach that people get set free by us, is that, you know, you get out of condemnation. And sometimes it can take like a year or so, but you get out of condemnation. You get under preaching of life and, uh, it's not focusing on that which you're doing wrong, but more about what you're doing right. And uh, then those things, when you sit under the right atmosphere and those things, those things automatically fall off. You know, and your associations, very important. Change your associations. Um, birds of a feather flock together. Uh, I understand if people have been smoking for 20 years or 30 years, it's a bit difficult. But, uh, you know, depending on age and who you hang around with, your environment, the greatest change a person can, the quickest way to change your life is to change your environment. Okay, um, so do not torture yourself because there's no condemnation in those who are in Christ. I'm not saying you can carry on and stuff, but that is for you and the Holy Spirit. doesn't make you any worse than, doesn't make you not a Christian, not at all. Can God use you? Of course he can. He's, he's omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, but it limits our testimony. It limits our char Christian, char Christian character. Smith Wigglesworth smoked a pipe. Yeah. Charles Spurgeon smoked a cigar, but that doesn't make, tell me I can smoke. Uh, you know, it's um, it doesn't tell me. I, each person must have with, but but it, it destroys testimony. For example, I choose not to drink alcohol yeah. because in South Africa, people are like, ah, oh, if you're a minister and you're drinking alcohol, you know, it, it destroys the. But maybe if you're in Italy, it's something totally different. So it's it's just it destroys a testimony. It depends how you want to really be used by God. Uh, in a testimony way, God can only use you as much as what people accept you really at the end of the day uh what does jesus mean that he can throw both soul and body in hell does that mean the body is in hell too very good question very good question and that is something that i believe we tackled in our hell series it is a paradox in scripture and it is a very good apologetic point that one uh there's a big argument against that so although this body has to go to the dust, there's still a type of body like this that will experience in heaven, but in hell. But there's a very good question. Uh, very good question. It's like some said that you will literally be given a body. I can't remember if we had a scripture for that. You'll be given a specific body for hell. When we, we went very deep into that, and that's not my forte, 
and my niche, so I don't have the scriptures right in my mind. Understand, I'm not a theologian. But I remember we, we, we did that when we went deep into the subject. And it was, it was quite interesting. So, um, there's a scripture, there's a scripture like that. Uh, I remember he prepared the body for us, and we're going to get into that now. Sorry for sounding stupid, but if the soul gets thrown into hell, what happens to the spirit? Uh, the soul and spirit is together. Now, also, there's some arguments on that. People say the spirit goes back to God. Um, there is an argument. We believe the spirit goes back to God for judgment and then gets sent. So there's a mixing. Remember, when the spirit of God came in, and especially the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there's a mixing between the soul and the spirit. The prophet is being proud and having pride the same thing. No, no, it's not. A lot of people can say, I'm so proud of my son and so on. There's nothing wrong with that. And our soul must go back to God through Jesus. Yes, but there the judgment will be made. So do the spirit of people able to be reborn? So that's what Christianity is all about. Definitely. So we are given the breath of life when Adam, when, when the breath of life was given to Adam. From that moment, anybody that gets born has the spirit of God in a context of the breath of life. You cannot, you cannot live without the Spirit of God. You cannot breathe without the Spirit of God. But when we say that we are baptized in the Holy Spirit and we get born again, we get saved, then it is like exactly like you're saying that it is a, it is a, um, so the Spirit of people are able to be reborn. So it's a reborning, it's a reviving. So it's the Holy Spirit coming upon your spirit. So it's, so that is being reborn, being what uh, 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 Jesus said to, 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 to Nathaniel, or no, um, said to, uh, Nicodemus at um, John chapter number three verse eight, he said, "Unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom. Cannot see the king. Cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless a man is born again, and the amplified says, unless a man is born from above, um, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God." Uh, mind the mouth. Is the rapture taking place before the tribulation? After when? See before the rapture. Uh, sorry, before the tribulation. Okay, uh, makes me sad. What that some pastors don't believe the rapture happened seven years before the tribulation. Dr. Perry Stone, Ed Henson, late, late Dr. Jackman MP, and many more that I believe with. Yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure on those teachings, but um, uh, it's not seven years before the tribulation, it's seven years before the return of Christ. So, um, the rapture will take place seven years before the second coming. Uh, flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God. Prophet is being proud. Okay, so I read that. Let me just take your comments. When souls will go to heaven, they one entity or two separate entities? Very good question. So we tackle those things. It is um, it's very difficult to, 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 to understand that dynamic. But the way of just really understanding it, it'll be together. You, you understand? Although it's two separate entities. Um, but it's very difficult because the Bible doesn't clarify this is how it will be in heaven and so on. We can just go on what is the meaning of spirit? What is the meaning of soul? What is the what is the a definition of spirit? What's the definition of soul? The tripartite of man, the spirit, which is the fellowship, communion, and intuition. Uh, and then you have um, uh, the soul, which is uh, will, intellect, and emotions. And you have the body, so this, which is the different gate. So awesome, awesome, awesome. So let's go on. Let's go on. Go with me to go with me to Revelation chapter number twenty-two, verse two. So remember, the tree of life was in the garden. It was that tree of life that actually kept Adam alive for 900 and something years, not 1,460 years, 930 years, 930 years. And uh, Revelation chapter number 22, verse 2, listen to this. In the middle of its street and either side of the river was the tree of life. Which bore 12 fruits, each Tree yielding its fruit every month. Uh, which the word tree is not really in there. So each yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were the healing of their nations. Verse 14. Listen to verse 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments. That they may have the right to the tree of life. And may enter through the gates into the city. But we see the tree of life giving fruits for. And we see how this was the tree that kept Adam and Eve alive. Or Adam alive before uh, Adam and Eve alive before they fall. Uh, 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 I want us to go on. I want us to go on. Go with me to where is that verse? Can you read for me? 
Uh, sorry, I've got a bit of assignments. It's, it's not like that. Can you go with me to Romans 8, verse... Just read me verse 26. Let's see what Romans 8, verse 26. How are you... Did you exist before you were born? With God. It says, likewise, the Spirit also helps us in our weaknesses. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us in weaknesses. Carry on reading. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought to. Mm -hmm. But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Carry on. Uh, now He who searches the hearts knows that the mind of the Spirit is, knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because He makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Verse Where am I now? And we Verse know, yeah, 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 yeah. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Mm -hmm. 29, for whom he foreknew. There. For whom he foreknew. Progi nosco. Yeah. Progi nosco. Yeah, that's true. Um, give me that Greek word. This is very important. Progi gnosko. Yeah which speaks of a prognosis and a gnosko, a knowing. That is why we get the word for new, for knowledge, prognosis and a knowledge being put together. Uh, sorry, when the scripture says for new, yeah, prognosko, what does it say again? The scripture, what does it say? It says, for whom he foreknew. For whom he foreknew. He also predestined. He also predestined. So just stop there. So there's predestination. But before there's a predestination, there's a foreknowledge. So hold on. These are two separate and two different situations that takes place before birth. The first one that is taking place is what we call foreknew. Foreknowledge. This is God having a prognosis of a knowledge about you, but it's not him only foreknowing you. The word know there is gnosko, which means an experiential knowledge, a relational knowledge. Very important. That means that God foreknew you. He, even before you were born, before the creation of this world, before creation itself, he had a conversation with you. He foreknew you. And even before he had a conversation, he knew and he planned out your life. Why do I say he had a conversation with you? Because we're going to get to predestination right now. And when God has a thought, that thought is his words. Yeah. We are speaking of different dimensions here. Who is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him. Yeah. I'm straining my voice. Who is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? When God is mindful of you, a thought in the spiritual realm is like a word in the natural realm. When we say that in the spiritual realm, Again, I'm saying, and I can make YouTube videos, but again, I'm saying the devil cannot pervert, uh, cannot create anything. He perverts. So let's touch on telepathy. Telepathy is the language of the fourth dimension when you are in heaven. Sure. You'll be thinking and it'll be happening. Am I saying telepathy is right? Please, dear God. No. When we do those things, and I'm sitting and I'm thinking, let me speak to David in my mind. That's soul power. Yeah. And I want to make that very clear. But I'm using the concept to explain how the spiritual realm operates, especially when we get to heaven, how the thoughts of God is as powerful. The Bible says that Abraham reasoned by faith and concluded that if he would kill his son, Isaac, that God would have raised him up from the yeah, dead. Yeah. He concluded it in his mind. And on the thought, the Bible says, God said, 
okay, you've killed your son. And Abram's like in the natural, but I haven't. And God says, no, 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 you have. In your mind, Jesus comes and he says, those who lust after a woman yeah. in their heart is as if they commit adultery. Uh, I hope this makes sense. So now the scripture where it says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. He doesn't say as a man speaketh. As you are just thinking, that is who you are. I think the word telepathy made many upset and it's going to make many Satan say, ah, we know that's the power that we used. I've never said I do it. it. That is soul power. I've seen people that try to do it when they don't understand how the prophetic works and they don't understand it's spiritual. It's not soulish. Ezekiel was sitting with his wife, yet God took him into another place for seven days while he was still. I was looking for that scripture. Did we ever find it? Ezekiel was? When he was sitting with his wife and was taken into Jerusalem for seven days. Wasn't it Jerusalem? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was um, when he was teleported. Yeah. It just says the hand of the Lord took him. Yeah. A friend argued once that the soul stays in the grave until the rapture according. That's called soul sleep. No scripture reference for it. So it's called soul sleep. No scripture reference for it. Um, please understand that Abram's bosom, where was it? It was next to hell. Yeah. Well, right. hell in the context. It was so it was down. Yeah. And there's a whole another thing when we get onto that. Yeah, uh, Jesus led them from there when he went down. Yeah, but there's another there's another thing. Uh, that's why the Bible says the earth ate up swallowed up people couldn't go up the only people that could go up was enoch and elijah there was no up yeah sure they had to go down because their down was their heaven until they were given a fair chance for salvation not one person will ever say they were not given an opportunity and then we see jesus went down and preached to the spirits and to everyone that was there and we see him fetching abram's bosom yeah. Taking it up, speaking, preaching to the spirits at Tartarus. Very interesting. Do you, baby, uh, prophet, do you babies and young children grow up in heaven or do they stay small? Uh, first of all, we need to define heaven. That's very important. Rem remember, heaven is temporal. Heaven is temporal. Hell is temporal. I'm going to say it again. Heaven is temporal. Hell is temporal. But Leon, how can you say that? Because hell will be cast into the lake of fire, which is permanent. Heaven will come down to the new earth, new Jerusalem. New, it will become new Jerusalem in new earth. So heaven will only be temporal. So we have to define. We're going to be in a natural world again. Uh, what are people saying? Okay, one more question. When we die, have we conscience, right? So I assume, according to the ND stories I've heard, so we have consciousness also. I would never believe the ND stories. Believe the Bible, guys. Very important. Remember, the devil can also give you experiences. Many ND stories is, is unbelievers. You can use it. If it's believers, you can use it a little bit, but always base it on the scripture. I know somebody who died who just saw black. Now, if I take that, it's going to confuse my faith, you know? Um, why can a person still have a dark, sinful, or negative thought whilst knowing it's not a thought in their heart, a desire, need a spiritual attack? Because there's a difference between a thought in your heart and a thought in your mind. Um, and we have to renew our minds. We have to renew our minds by the Word of God. It's a process. Our spirit is saved instantly. Our soul is being saved and our body will be saved. If we are soul sleeping in the grave, then what does it mean? I'm saying we are not soul sleeping. Guys, please understand me. 
I don't know if I'm not clear enough. No, you're clear. I never said we are soul sleeping. Never said we are soul sleeping, so I don't even know what it means. What it means is simply you just lie there and you wait. Okay. Okay. Bible says to die for man once and then the judgment. Uh, can people from heaven see us here on earth and pray for us? Very good question. Very good question and quite an argument that I have on that. Because the, the Lazarus said, go and tell them. Yeah. As if he couldn't see them. So there's a great argument on, on, on that one. <laughs> we, we think of heaven as the dimension we are in right now. And because of that, we limit. And it's temporal uh, hell. Temporal hell is simply because the terminology of hell is temporal and then will be thrown into a permanent lake of fire. When we say heaven, we're speaking of a spiritual dimension, but that will come down onto a new earth and in the form of New Jerusalem. And that is why heaven is temporal because it will only be there for a moment in time until it comes down into the new earth. So we just always say heaven, but we actually, you know, theologically it's totally different. So that's what I mean by temporal. Uh, so what's the difference between a trance and a dream? Totally different. A dream is when you're sleeping. A trance is when you're awake. Uh, let's get to foreknowledge, foreknew. Romans chapter number 8, verse 29. It says, He foreknew and predest predestined us. So the word foreknew is God had a foreknowledge, a prognosis knowledge about us. Then He predestined. The word predestined means He created a destiny for us. A destination and then we were sent on that assignment. You were sent on this earth for a mandate, an assignment, a purpose. No general, no, uh, 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 no military uh, officer, no military general sent somebody on an assignment without that person knowing what the assignment is about. So when you discover your destiny and purpose on this earth, it's because you already knew it. You just had to discover it now because you are a spiritual person who is experiencing a natural disposition, if I can put it like that, a natural experience. So, foreknowledge. Let me just explain this. So, let's say, so God foreknew us, whom predestined us. What is predestined? Predestination. Scholars break this up in quite a few different things. And a lot of people, when we use the word predestination, they think we mean pre-election for salvation. Doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that. So scholars believe that when you are foreordained, predestined, that it means that God has foreordained everything that will happen in your life. And number two, some of them believe that it means of salvation. And they use that view. They take scripturally to say about Paul, they use Judas. They say Paul was predestined to be saved. They say Judas was, um, the Bible says that he went into his own place. He was, uh, he fulfilled scriptures. He had to, it had to take place. And they use that as, as um, pre-election. You cannot because that is, and then they take the false prophet and the antichrist to say, you know, but they are pre-elected. You're, so we must understand that the Antichrist, false prophet, is re-elected. Uh, sorry, is pre-elected for damnation. Because they are not human. I'm going to say it again. They are not human. There's something called the seed of the serpent. The Antichrist has to come from the seed of the serpent. Very important. He, it will be impossible for him to be saved. Yes. It's, so there's no like, oh, shame, this person. No, it's not a person. The seed of the serpent. Nephilim. That is my viewpoint. When you understand and read the Bible in, in an Enochian mindset, uh, with a, with a, you know, when you look at the New Testament, if you look at Corinthians, you look at Paul, you look at Colossians, and uh, you see how they uh, read it with a Mesopotamian worldview. Very important because they even use, Jude even used the book of Enoch to give a prophetic type word. So we in our Western civilization 
and mindset battle to understand the concept or an Enochian mindset. Very difficult. So there's the seed of the serpent. Antichrist. So there's nothing of, they're not predestined as a, no, no, no. You have a, as a person have a decision. Everyone has the ability to decide. Even though God knew in his foreknowledge and his predestination, he, so people are like, okay, but if God knew we were sin, why doesn't he save us? He did. God knew in his foreknowledge, in his predestination, uh, sorry, in his foreknowledge, in his predestination about you, that you were going to sin. And therefore he created his son before the foundations of this world to bring in a, a discourse and a rescue mission. So God knew everything in his omniscience, everything. Hence, that's why he sent his son. Uh, if, if there was predestination or pre-election to salvation, there would be no need to preach the gospel. So a lot of Calvinists believe this, that only some will be saved or some don't have to, cannot get saved. It's a Calvinistic mindset. Um, then there's no need to preach the gospel. Then there's no need for the Bible to say that the gospel needs to be preached. Then there's, uh, there's no need for that. Um, the, if that was there was no there would be no need for the crucifixion there would be no need for Christ to have died for sinners there would be no need for his blood if the, if pre-election even comes into play so just as Esau willfully chose to give up his birthright every single one of us have a choice to accept the message to repent and be baptized very very simple uh, so the word for knowledge basically means to be known in heaven. That God had a knowledge about you. Jeremiah 1 verse 5. The scripture says, Before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you to a, pro a prophet to the nations. But the word there is new. Before you were formed in the womb, I knew you. Ayada you. Can you read me Jeremiah 1 verse 5 out of the King James Version? <laughs> uh, before I formed thee in the bellies, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. Now stop right there. Belly and womb is two different things. We're speaking about a natural and a spiritual part here. When the Bible speaks about belly, it's spiritual. What is the belly of the earth? Isn't that hell? Yeah. So, I want you to read Jeremiah chapter number 1 verse 5 a little bit differently. Because there's a formation in the spiritual and there's a formation in the natural. In the natural, God prepared a body for us while He formed every part of us. So, so, so foreknowledge. You were known in heaven. You were set apart. You were called. You were commissioned, ordained mandated by God. I remember when, 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 when we planted the church, I had an encounter with an angel and, uh, uh, and with that I never need man's approval or anything like that. Uh, that was an encounter with an angel. But in that encounter that I had with that angel, that experience I had with an angel, I remember being taken into another place instantly. And I was in a military recruitment, like a boot camp, and a spotlight went on on me. And as the spotlight came on me, I saw everybody who was all in military clothes, listening to generals and sergeants. Everybody gave way, and there was a spotlight on me. And as the spotlight was on me, the uh, the general on, on on that was like sending orders and giving people orders pointed at me, and said, "Now I want you to go." That was directly, when I say split second, while I was still walking and talking with an angel, it was like, and I was gone into another place. Spiritual things is very difficult to explain. And then I was taken from there into another place. This was just my 
sending of uh, of 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 um, ministry. I had a clear cut encounter with God. A lot of people want to do ministry or they want to do plant a church, and etc. Without an encounter, it's it's not the measure of your encounter and the the revelation or the rhema word given to you is the measure that will carry you through times of trouble because it is that which gives you faith if you're appointed or promoted by man you're not going to be able to carry a divine call and stand through the prom through the troubles that will require power versus power so i have sanctified you set you apart i've yadad you the word yada is a knowing it's a sense of seeing, but it means a, a experiential knowing. Uh, uh, let's go. Let's go. Let's look at Jesus' life, the pre-existence with Christ. John, John, one verse. John chapter number one, verse one. John chapter number one, verse one. Listen to this. Listen to this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Now listen to this. And in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God. He was the begin. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light. It all went through him. Might, that all went through him might believe. It says that Christ was the word, meaning that Christ existed before he was on this earth. John chapter number 8 verse 56. John chapter number 8 verse 56. And I want you to just listen. I know you might not have a Bible to turn to. John chapter number 8 verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and he was glad. Verse 58. Listen to this. Jesus said to them, Most surely I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So he said, before I was born, I existed. Now, I'm not putting you in the place of Christ. I'm just looking in the case of Christ. I'm not putting you in the place. I'm just looking at the case of Christ. It is illegal for a spirit to dwell on this earth without a body. It's illegal. Why do you think demons are hunting for a body? They need a body. They lust after the body. They want a body. They are disembodied spirits. Hebrews 10 verse 5 is one of the main ones I want to, what verses I want to get to. Hebrews 10 verse 5. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. The word prepared there means to frame and join together. He said, when I came in, you prepared a body. Let me tell you, you were alive long before your body was alive. God prepared your body for the function, uh, sorry, for the purpose that you were created for, not born for. There's created and there's born. If you are black, it's because of purpose. If you are white, it's because of purpose. If you have a body that is deformed, the Bible says, uh, 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 let me not get for the glory of God. Let me not get into that verse. But let me, Lord, the, there's a lot of people that have like Down syndrome. Am I saying it's the will of God? No. But many of them are bringing glory to God. A body has been prepared. I'm not saying at all. I know people with Down syndrome, children. And I'm not saying at all that that was God's will. Not at all. But God used all things to prepare, uh, for the good. To, uh, God turns out all things for the good to those who love him. He uses all things. Um, uh, works out everything together for the good. So, but a body was prepared. A lot of people are not accepting of their body. Now you have plastic surgery. You have all this stuff. Really, we have a life at a soul of spirit. We're born on earth. Yes, so we're not preaching. The, so everything we're teaching is in scripture. I'm giving scripture references for this. Once you have an encounter with God, you will get revelation that, hey, I was alive. Uh, 
Um, what was I saying just now? I was saying something important. I was saying something important just now. Yes. So God created a body for you <laughs> because of purpose, because of the mandate that's been given to you, your body. A lot of people don't want to accept their bodies the way they are. And they go into, they go into, uh, into plastic surgery. They go into, into all these things. And we were watching a video uh, on, 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 on TikTok and you saw this ugly woman. And please, I'm going to say ugly. Really ugly. And what I mean, I know God is now ugly. No, no, no. This person was ugly. Very ugly. Looked like a demon. And then uh, they put makeup on. And after you see that they put makeup on, you'll be like, but this is a model. Oh, yeah, I saw that. And you can see how really from the teeth to that person. Yo. I thought I was seeing a spirit when I was looking at them. <laughs> so bad it is. <laughs> and then makeup changes. Now, please, I don't say you must accept your body like that. Okay. But I mean, you know, with makeup these days, you don't even know anymore. Uh, that's why men must be careful with dating. You see the swimming pool test. The swimming pool test. Um... No, tattoos count as plastic surgery. No, I, it, it comes down to the intent, I would say. If I get a tattoo, it's not because I'm going to change the world. I, 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 uh, if I get a tattoo, it might be because of a reminder of something or a, you know, something like that. But plastic surgery is because I'm not happy with the way God made me. Now, I'm not speaking of plastic surgery for medical purpose or reason. I'm speaking of the trend where people are no longer happy. And what happens is they try to find happiness in something else and they don't get the satisfaction. They, they, they never accept who God has created them to be. And I'm very, very, I'm very, 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 uh, there's things I don't like about my body. And I think it has become so desensitized that we think, okay, let me just change it and so on. And it's okay. It, it, it's not, we don't want to get legalistic. There's nothing wrong with it. Even if you've done it, how many on your plastic surgery, okay? It, it's just that once that now becomes the, it becomes such a way of life. Many will understand what I, what I mean by that. It becomes such a way of life. It's like people get it at the age of 20. For what reason? It's because they've never been affirmed. Especially when it comes to women, they've never been affirmed, whether it was by their fathers or whoever, that they are beautiful or that they are loved. And then they try to find acceptance in the world in a standard out there that is not right. And they end up more insecure. They end up more messed up, damaged. Out of a culture out there that is a culture that says you must meet a certain standard. So I'm not saying you can be fat and then everything is fine. Be like go on diets and be fit. <laughs> I saw that one woman doing a um. But you know that woman that that played in um. What is that musical? Not a musical, but they that Australian woman with a blonde hair, big woman that was so funny and she played in. Uh, uh, Fat Amy from Fat, Fat Amy. What what is it? What, what is it? Rebel Wilson. Rebel Wilson. Yes. I don't know if anybody has seen her diet. Yo, she she's like a model like, now. Yeah, she's like from that to a model. I just saw that yesterday and I was like, wow. Okay. And now we're gonna have partners cancelling and stuff like that. Pitch perfect. Yeah. testosterone and I'm speaking of testosterone when they are perfectly healthy then they take that to really it's it's all identity issues it's all identity because they can never really accept the way God has made them and it's nothing but not looking good you know we must be healthy we must look good but I'm I know I know I know people understand what I'm saying okay uh, otherwise you can ask on your so so he has prepared a body for us framed it together 
let's go to um, let's go to Psalm 139 verse 16. Psalm 139 verse 16. Listen to this. Once you have an encounter with God, you accept who you are. Yes, you can change and you can become healthy, but you accept who you are. And that acceptance brings security and brings peace. And only once you can love yourself can you love others. Yeah. When you do plastic surgery, you don't love yourself because you're not happy with yourself. And I'm saying plastic surgery in the culture and the attitude of just wanting to, to, to fit a certain image and meet a certain requirement. It's very dangerous. It's very, it's very, um, it's very wrong for your soul. Very wrong for your soul. Very unhealthy for your soul. Uh, just a random question, totally unrelated. If gluten, gluttony is eating too much, where do we draw the line? Because that's too much for you. It's not too much for me. Say, for example, I eat all the time. I constantly got something in my. Yeah, there's no line to it. Um, but I, we can be deceived. Then you have people eating out of what they call pleasure eating. You have people that are eating in out of insecurity. You have people. So. The, you, yes, you're right, there's not a line, but I believe that you can deceive yourself. And unless there's somebody that can speak to you, now gluttony is not, it's more, you know, when it comes to controlling your belly, oh, the Bible, the Bible, what does it say in Jude? It says they are there to feed their own bellies, oh, yeah. to fill their own bellies only. So the Bible actually looks at overeating as a very sinful thing, let me be honest. If you study the subject of overeating and the belly of filling your own bellies, because you see, again, what is belly? It's spiritual. So when you have food going into your stomach, there's a spiritual belly. It's a direct, it's a direct connotation. That's why fasting is very powerful. And gluttony means you cannot take control of your lusts, your pleasures, uh, your the, the, the pleasures of this life. Jude, what Jude does it says, say? Jude says their God is their belly. Their God is their belly. Romans says that um, they serve not our Lord Jesus, but they serve their own belly. Yeah, they serve not our Lord Jesus, but they serve our own belly. Now, I can get into like a uh, watch many doctrine. They'll say you can only serve God or serve your belly. Okay, so um, uh, that's a bit heavy. But as long as you can have control over your belly, you can have control over your spiritual life. When I've seen people change from drugs to food. Still an addiction. So your spirit is created. Your body is formed. Psalm 139 verse 16. Listen to this. Your eyes saw my substance, David said, yet being unformed. So David is saying, I had a substance before I was formed. You didn't only even think of me. I was there. You saw my substance. Before I was formed, being yet unformed. And in your book, they all were written. The days fashioned for me, when as if there were none of them. Before my day started, before creation was started, you had a book written over my life. You have the book of life. You have the book of God's perfect will for your life. You have the book of your own life, three different books. Then you have the book of tears. Then you have the book of warriors. Yeah. Then you have the book of remembrance. Wait, 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 wait. And the book of the Lamb's book of life. Seven books. And we taught on that. So very important to understand the book of life. The book of God's perfect will for your life. And the book of your own life. Very, very important to understand the difference between those three books. So, so, so David said, before I was even formed, you saw my substance, meaning you were even when God just had a thought about you, you were already existing. David wrote in Psalm 139, Psalm 139, 139 verse 13, for you formed my inward parts, your, my spirit. You formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you. He created his spirit, but there's, 
spiritual realities that was formed, that was with coming a womb, coming into life. For I am fearfully and wonderfully made, marvelously our works. Uh, I was skillfully put together and wrought in the lowest parts. Can you remove the website? The website is still on here. Uh, lowest parts of the earth. So there is an argument where people are saying, okay, when does life come into a, when does life come? Does life come at conception? Does life come six months after conception? Does life come at birth? Uh, when the child takes the breath, uh, when they are breathing, uh, uh, life comes at conception according to scripture. It's alive. The child is alive at conception. And there's too much scriptural backing for that. Life doesn't even come at conception. Life comes way before it. You're alive before it. So we spoke about the books of heaven. Then we can get into preordination or pre-election where the Bible says the lamb was slain before the foundation of this world. But then it also says that those whose names were not found written in the lamb's book of life Uh, in the book of life, but that doesn't mean we, uh, those who preach pre-election take that verse out of context. So when we say predestination, pre-election, we never refer it to salvation. We refer it to destiny and purpose. And when we put it to, you know, when it gets to uh, salvation and so on, ah, it's difficult because when we say, you know, uh, we just mess, whatever doctrine cannot mess with our, with God's divine attributes and qualities, which is omnipotent, omniscient. So did God know you were going to sin? Yes. Did God know you were going to, you were not going to, uh, you were going to be lost in this world? Yep. Um, but in his knowing, he gave you free will. And in his knowing, he created, uh, he, he, he created the scenario for his son and his, uh, as a lamb to be slain before the foundation of this world for your sins in God's omniscience, in his omnipresence, his omnipotency. We see there was life before um, before you were born. You had a yara life. Everything about you existed before you were born. Your body was simply prepared for the function or the mandate you were given. When God announced, mandated, commissioned, ordained, assigned, set apart and sanctified you. What does a revelation do? An encounter with God. It gives you the ability to discover the destiny that God has for you and discover what has been discussed long before the creation of this world. The Bible says that the Lord said, let us make man in our image. Just that scriptural reference tells us and it's backed up in, 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 in other scriptures tells us that there was a discussion about your life. There was a discussion. What you were set out to do. What you were going to do. So Romans 8 verse 29. What, just read it to me. He foreknew. I want to just close off with this. Remember we said the image of Christ. He says, um, for whom he foreknew. For whom he foreknew, which is you now. He also predestined. He also predestined. So he foreknew you and he predestined you. To be conformed to the image of his son. To be conformed to the image of his son. So he foreknew that you have to have his son. So God foreknew, predestined, that you were going to mess up, that we we're going to be lost, that we need the image of his son to be restored back into alignment and relationship with God. What happens when our assignment given you on earth is not completed and we die? Well, it's exactly just that. We die without completing our assignment. And if we are saved, we just won't get rewards. If we are not saved, well, we are not saved. Uh, but if we are saved, we just will go to heaven empty. So that's why it's so important to fulfill your assignment, to know your assignment. Prophetic churches are very important. That this makes you discover your assignment. Uh did we know new birth, what our callings were? Did we know before birth what our callings would be? Exactly, that's what I said now, yes. Your mind just can't remember it. 
Revelation is simply discovering and remembering what has happened. Uh, what is prophecy or vision? It's, 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 it's memories of the future. It's memories. So when I said you have spirit, soul, body, spirit, you have tripartite. So spirit is fellowship, communion, intuition. The voice of God is birthed in the department called intuition. Intuition works with a subconscious memory. 